Hello, everyone, and welcome to our, our October uh, First Friday webinar. Uh, just a quick, some quick reminders. If you want to please log into a Gmail account, and that way you'll be able to chat with us if you have any questions for the presenters. And at the end, I'll also put up the, the survey or the assessment so that we can get some great feedback for our presenters today. But at this time, I'm going to go ahead and hand it off to Francis and Christina to talk about family housing and university apartments. Hello, everybody. Thank you for coming to our first Friday webinar, or I guess staying where you are for your first Friday webinar, but it's still appreciated. Um, so our topic today is family housing and university apartments serving the unique needs of the unique resident population. Um, we'll talk a little bit about what the outline for that looks like. There we go. Um, but first, who are we? So I'm Francis. I'm the area coordinator here in family housing. Um, so I'm sort of like the, the, the res life outfacing representative for students um, to sort of address concerns around neighbor conflicts. I work with the student staff that we'll talk about in a little bit. I've been here since 2015. Um, and what drew me to work in family housing, if I'm being perfectly honest, I was really just trying to find a school in Oregon um, and this job was open. But um, it really was a, a huge game changer for me in ways that will become apparent throughout the course of the presentation. Um, it was really the shift I was looking for in housing without realizing it. Um, and it's work I've really, really come to love. And I'm Christina Bieland. I'm the Assignments and Services Coordinator here at Family Housing. Um, I've been in this position since August of 2017. And essentially, I oversee the front desk and um, all the daily tasks that happen at that desk, uh, helping students find resources, that sort of thing. Um, and essentially sending out room assignments to um, interested students um, that might be the best. Uh, I have some undergrad experience uh, working in family housing, primarily in programming, so I really enjoyed that period of my life, and when I saw this opening, I was really excited. Um, the culture and community is pretty much what drew me. Um, I also have a strong interest in helping students navigate the complicated systems that can help students, first year students or non traditional students, um, international students, all the populations we have here at family housing. Groovy. Um, so the outline today, we're going to talk about who we are at UO, not necessarily who Christina and I are, um, but what family housing means when we talk about it here, uh, what challenges our residents face, um, how we've tried to meet those challenges, um, and then we're going to kind of look behind the scenes at the challenges that we have as family housing staff members, because it can be a very challenging part of housing to work within, um, and, and sometimes the support isn't always necessarily immediately apparent. Um, you got to kind of find your own homegrown ways of dealing with things. Um, and then we'll, uh, at the end, talk about some stuff we're planning for the future. Um, we do have the cool kind of um, live stream chat on the side. Um, and I'm saying that we want to move that mic a little bit closer. Um, so if you have questions throughout, don't hesitate to ask them. We can pause and answer those as we go. Um, but there's also going to be time for questions at the end. So here we go. Um, before we kind of get into the meat, we wanted to define terms and just have a shared understanding of, of what we're talking about today. Um, so our housing uh, is called Family Housing and University Apartments, or FHUA. Um, colleagues at other institutions who work in a similar type of housing can, can refer to it as University Apartments. Uh, sometimes it's specifically for graduate students and it's graduate housing. Um, I've also heard it referred to as non-traditional student housing. Um, but for our purposes, we're going to be calling it family housing today, even though, uh, as we'll talk about, we have all kinds of residents who live out here. Um, and when we talk about non-traditional students, we're using this definition um, that we pulled from the National Center for Education Statistics. Um, non-traditional would apply to anybody who has delayed enrollment, um, attends college part-time, uh, works full-time while going to school for work part-time. Um, is financially independent or cut off in some way from, uh, from another source of funding, has dependents other than a spouse, is a single parent, or does not have a high school diploma. I've also heard non-traditional apply to international students, students with disabilities. Um, there's a lot of different ways that term can be used, but um, this definition, I think, fits with a number of our residents. So that's kind of the one we're rolling with today. Um, so we're going to start by kind of the, the real first thing we want to talk about is, is the ways that family housing um, kind of differs from other types of housing. And so I'm going to tell a little anecdote. Um, this is a real picture from one of our first events. Uh, it is uh, our fall festival. And so we were having a 
craft for kids and make your own monster craft. And I think anybody who's watching this who is a parent or who has younger sibling will be able to immediately notice something that I did very wrong when setting up this otherwise very Pinteresty looking table. Um, I left a big old pile of scissors just at the corner. And fortunately, I didn't learn this lesson the hard way, um, but I looked over pretty quickly as the event started and parents were just taking the scissors, moving them into the center of the table. And that for me was kind of my wake up call to that I was no longer in Kansas. You know, like this was not an undergrad res hall. I had residents now who would do something like grab scissors and run around with them and pretend to be pirates. So um, that just for me was like a real concrete illustration that this is such a different group to work with. And there's so many different considerations. Um, so with that, we want to talk a little bit about our scope who we serve, um, and we have got some maps to accompany this slide. Um, so our Spencer View apartment complex is our largest housing area with 272 units. Uh, Graduate Village has 72 units between two buildings. Um, prior to 2018, we have graduate students living there only. Um, recently, we've opened up with our new uh, rental contract to state that any student over the age of 21 who is um, enrolled full-time in the Lincoln Graduate Village. Um, they are primarily studios and one bedrooms, um, varying in you know, larger or standard sizes. Uh, we also have our East Campus homes, which are um, total 46. They range from, actually we have one studio house, and then um, they range from one to five bedroom houses um, scattered closer to campus. We also have our Agate Apartments, which are also very close to campus with 20 units. So I was just checking something with our mic, and I'm realizing that we're using the internal mic. So actually, if you want to move mm -hmm. closer, we have an external mic here, but I don't think that's what's picking us up. So just real quick. All righty. Um, so just to kind of illustrate that, this is Spencer View Apartments. So this is where the bulk of our apartments are. Um, you can see they're broken up by colored uh, neighborhoods. Um, the colors represent or refer to the doors on those apartments. So the apartments are all the standard sort of yellow and green, um, go ducks. Um, but the doors are different colors to sort of distinguish which areas are which. And that's how we assign our, 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 our community assistance to different areas. So 272 units. Um, these are our East Campus houses. Um, we've got, I don't know if y'all can see the mouse, but I'm sort of hovering over Agate Apartments in the top left corner. That's about 19, those 19 apartments Christina was talking about. Um, our graduate village is not actually pictured, but it's kind of off to the bottom. Oh, here it is. Sorry, it's the purple on the bottom right. Um, and you can see it runs adjacent to these yellow and blue and green squares. These are our East Campus houses. The yellow rectangles are the ones that we actually own. And these are houses that range from 1910, some older, um, to houses that were built more recently in the 90s. Um, but it's literally just a neighborhood that the university purchased as a land bank. Um, but we keep families there. We don't keep them there. <laughs> they're there of their own volition. Um, and just to give you a sense of the spread of all this, um, down in the bottom left, that's Spencer View Apartments. Um, and then up here kind of in the middle right um, is where you have our, our East Campus houses, Agate Apartments, Graduate Village. And then main campus is sort of this top middle piece. You can see we're pretty spread out. Um, who are our residents? So we have mainly leaseholders and household members. And our leaseholders run the gamut of identity. We've got a lot of veteran students, non-traditionally aged students. So these are folks who either started late or stopped out. Um, students with families. And some traditional undergraduates. This is becoming a very popular housing option for folks who want to remain within the housing family, but also don't want to continue living in a residence hall room. Uh, they want to get some of that apartment experience. Um, and that, of course, causes some uh, conflict, the more uh, traditional undergrads we have out here, um, because obviously there's very different needs sometimes between non-traditional and traditional undergraduates. Um, who else do we have here? Our household members. Well, um, eligibility for all household members is um, basically they have to be a, a parent, a dependent, a spouse or partner, um, other family members are considered. Um, we also have roommates of, typically this is undergrads or grad students who are single, don't want to occupy um, an apartment by themselves. So they um, grab another eligible student who would be full-time enrolled and over the age of 20. 
Um, we don't do formal roommate matching with the service. We typically um, have sort of a permission <laughs> list of folks who are looking for roommates um, to be added to that list, and, and we can give that out to others who are looking for those roommates. So kind of a informal matching service, I guess. Um, it's a Google Doc. Yeah. <laughs> Very low tech. It's a, it's a list. <laughs> Um, we also have a number of emotional support animals um, over here in Spencerview as well as throughout. Uh, we do allow pets in our East Campus houses, but um, with service animals and emotional support animals are allowed in other units, um, which is on the rise. Mm -hmm. um, household members are not held to the lease, so they can sort of come and go as they please. We just have the one primary leaseholder. Um, they are responsible for all the rent and um, their essentially their household members activity and <laughs> things like that in the community so um they are able to submit requests to add roommates though so we can still track who's living where yeah the the whole not contracting with the roommate has caused some issues because since they're not on contract they can just up and leave uh which leaves the leaseholder holding the bill but conversely if the leaseholder decides they just don't want to live with that person then that person is trespassing and so it has created some roommate conflicts on both sides of that equation. But yeah, landlord tenant law is kind of a messy thing. And it is probably the biggest difference um, between a traditional undergrad residence hall. Um, I don't know that this would apply at all universities, but for us in Oregon, if you're in an apartment, you're held by landlord tenant law. So we have totally different contracts. Um, <clears throat> and we have a lot of international residents, 49% is a number that I was quoted when I got out here three years ago. Um, that number hasn't really fluctuated. Um, some of the factors that influence this, folks can apply before they even get to the US. So that's a huge help. A lot of folks, um, when they're trying to apply for housing, um, they need to physically be here. Um, some of them, uh, because of the documentation that's required, can't even get an apartment um, outside of UO. So this is extremely helpful for our international students. Um, we have a lot of different nationalities represented here, um, Korea, China, Japan, um, Turkey, uh, West Africa. Um, and these are all pockets that have formed their own community within family housing. So folks know about that by reputation. So they know that by coming here, they'll be around folks who understand their experience and who they can connect with right off the gate. Um, and cost, uh, it's very expensive to be an international student at any university. Um, and uh, that is the same at the UL. So because our units are fairly inexpensive, it's a great option for our international folks coming in. So that's who our residents are. What do they need? Um, I'm seeing that Catherine Magura is saying, OSU, we aren't under landlord tenant laws at Oregon State. I am so jealous. Um, I don't know why that is. I would actually love to speak with you or our general counsel just to kind of see what it is about the housing out here that requires us to be under landlord tenant law. But it would definitely, I think, solve a lot of headaches if we were. Um, so that would be a great conversation to have. Um, but that's very interesting to know. Um, <clears throat> financial needs. So these are, so I'm talking about the needs of some of these folks in family housing. Financial needs. Any student runs into this, but particularly our non-traditional students. Um, and that can be because of the cost of raising a family, uh, the fact that they're in many instances starting later in life with fewer savings. Um, they're bound by sometimes very strict financial aid policies. Um, that can be uh, challenging so far as how many credits they have to take um, while balancing other responsibilities. There's not a ton of local employment opportunity. Um, <clears throat> really, no matter what field you're looking for, whether you're looking to find part-time work or full-time work, it's very challenging uh, in Eugene. And I think that that's true for other places in Oregon as well. Um, cost of living. Uh, it's relatively lower in Oregon, I think some folks move to Oregon with the sense that it'll be uh, less expensive than some other states. Um, particularly, we have a lot of folks who move up from California. But Eugene, it's more expensive than some other Oregon towns. Um, I would say that that's true of a lot of the Oregon city centers. Um, so even though um, folks may be coming here for a lower cost of living, that does not wind up being the case for a lot of our folks. Um, security and safety. This is not what our bike thieves look like, but It'd be nice if they did, because they'd be easier to catch. Um, we have a ton of crime in Spencerview. It's a real problem. Uh, a lot of theft, people taking bikes off the balcony, breaking into cars, um, a lot of trespassing, which we would not have as much of an issue with, but sometimes it um, 
is trespassing that then leads to other crimes. Um, and it gets exacerbated by resident behavior. We have folks who will just sort of leave stuff out, appliances um, and other things that they think people might want. Uh, and it ends up just sitting there and it kind of draws the attention of folks who are, who are looking to, to take things. Um, in trying to address security and safety in family housing, um, that's a, I just saw Catherine's comment. Don't ruin, we, we promise we will not bring landlord tenant law to OSU. <laughs> we'll do our best anyway. Um, we're fighting citywide trends. There's heavy drug use in Eugene, um, and that means that people are trying to make that money to steal drugs, or not steal drugs, stealing things to make money to buy drugs. Um, lack of mental health resources, and there are the resources for the unhoused. And you know, we run into this really challenging space of trying to balance our compassion with also knowing that our residents are experiencing crime. And it's just, it's, it's been a real philosophical and it's just been an issue. Um, but it's something we're working on with UOPD. Um, but yeah, there is a fair amount of crime and that's something that we are trying to work on. Lack of relevant social opportunities. Um, so there's a lot of things on campus that don't really feel like a space for a lot of our non-trad students, or so they tell us. Um, and that can be because they're busy balancing their work schedules and family schedules. Um, sometimes they feel out of place with their more traditionally aged classmates. Um, sometimes just balancing all the responsibilities of a non-trad student leaves them without the energy to seek out opportunities. And also, and this is, you know, maybe this is just me saying personally, when you get out here, Oregon, be, Oregon can be a little clicky. Um, you know, a lot of people, when I moved to Eugene, they've kind of known each other all their lives, and everyone's very friendly, but it can be hard sometimes to break into that friend group for our out-of-state students. Um, and meetups in Eugene tend to cater to more like bar outings and trivia nights and pub quiz. If you're a parent, um, that's not something that's going to necessarily be accessible to you. Um, so another challenge we face is distance from campus. Um, the same resources that are offered on campus are, you know, even though Spencer View, say, is a mile away from campus, are sometimes difficult to access. Um, they're also not really marketed here um, or to family populations. Um, public transportation is better than most cities, but it's still not very uh, comprehensive here. So our bus schedules are sometimes, it takes a while just to get a mile away. Um, and child care and schools are spread throughout the city, which complicates time management for our students here. Um, and of course, bike theft is an epidemic, so if you get your bike stolen a few times, you're probably going to be less inclined to hop over to campus for social events and things like that. A UOPD officer actually told me that there is a bike mafia that literally runs up and down the I-5 corridor. They will <laughs> steal bikes in Eugene, they'll steal bikes in Corvallis, then they'll go sell them in Seattle and vice versa. I don't, I don't know the extent to which that's real, but it definitely is hard to hold on to a bike, which really makes it difficult for residents to get around. Um, I frequently refer to us as either Winterfell or The Wall um, because of our distance from campus, and so that is what that image is. Shout out to all you Game of Thrones nerds. Um, and then all of those challenges are also still there for our international students, plus others, um, because it's the same financial challenges but fewer resources. It's harder to be able to get work. Um, as an international student, there are laws that govern how many hours they can work on campus, for example, including in some of our student staff positions. Um, and that makes it challenging to be able to make enough money to pay that increased tuition that they're paying. Um, the system, I don't feel, is designed for them. Um, language difficulties make it really hard to then sort of interpret a contract that's written out in this very landlord-tenant law heavy language. Um, and we don't necessarily have um, documents available that are uh, interpreted into the student's home language. We do have a really awesome Office of International Affairs, um, you know, so that's great, um, but it can still be challenging. And then just, you know, racism. There's a lot of it. Um, I think there's a lot of it everywhere, but particularly in Eugene, um, and that can be very challenging for international students. Um, I'm getting a question, how far are your apartments from campus in comparison to the farthest residential areas? That is a great question. So our East Campus houses and our Graduate Village are literally abutting um, the parts of campus where our residential halls are. Spencer View, I would say I ride my bike every day from main campus and it's about a seven to eight minute bike ride. 
Um, but what's interesting is it's actually not really any further than Barnhart, which is uh, a large residence hall that is also off-site. Yeah. I think it's approximately 0.9 miles away from the edge of campus. Yeah, so I mean, it's, it is totally walkable, but long walkable, and it's just kind of one more thing to sort of factor in. But yeah, it's, it's definitely further than some of the off-campus housing options. So how do we find solutions to these issues? We're trying. Um, so before we kind of talk about those specific, we presented you with some challenges, now let's talk about how we meet those challenges. We're gonna talk about some of our general services. Um, our staffing, we've got five community assistants. So these are basically our RAs, but for family housing. So their roles are very similar, um, but obviously just a little more nuanced for family housing. Um, they do a lot of community building through programming, through uh, outreach to new residents, some conflict resolution, um, though ultimately a lot of that gets bumped over to my office. Um, administrative support, so helping out at the desk. They do hours on Saturday so that we can have the office open on Saturday, which is cool. And uh, conduct enforcement. Uh, they don't do rounds, but yeah. Um, I'm seeing a question. Both being state institutions in the same state, how is OSU not bound by landlord tenant laws, but Oregon is? Catherine, I am so sorry. I promise I'm not trying to ruin it for you. Um, I really don't know. It's it's a great question. Um, I, I didn't know that until just now. Um, so I would be curious to kind of find out from our general counsel. Um, if it's of interest to you, um, you can shoot us an email. Our emails are going to be at the end of the presentation. Um, and I'm happy to sort of let you know what I find out. Um, and we're going to try to do that without ruining Catherine's experience <laughs> at OSU. Um, some other services, we have office hours that kind of conform to student schedule. So we are not nine to five like our main campus housing office. We are nine, we are eight to six. Um, we have a community room that folks can rent out for parties. We've had people have like their wedding in that community room. Um, and we have community gardens and composting. So those are some nice things. Um, and who are our staff members? Um, so our professional staff over at the Spencer View office is uh, myself and Francis. Um, we kind of oversee daily activity in the office and Francis handles more of the conduct side. Um, I'm more administrative. Uh, student staff, we have the community assistants who are also students and we have about five desk assistants that uh, manage the front desk and um, are there to provide customer service and support to our students as well. Uh, we also have our custodial coordinator, Jeannie, and our facilities manager, Carlo, who oversee um, the apartment turnover, making sure uh, maintenance requests are being handled, that sort of thing. And that I think is one of the most special parts about working out here is the relationship between res life and facilities is just so wonderful. You know, Jeannie and Carlo will come by our offices, they'll tell us what they're seeing out there in the neighborhood. We collaborate on the newsletter on our petitions committee, which we'll talk about in a bit. Um, so that sort of integration of like the facilities and res life as not being two separate entities, I think is really awesome. Um, and this picture is just of our family housing table at the awards ceremony. And as you can see, a lot of our community assistants are parents. Um, and so we always have to book many extra chairs at the awards dinner. Um, so how do we meet those <clears throat> specific challenges we referenced earlier? So when we talk about non-trad students having these financial needs, we try to meet that with flexibility. Um, when I first got out here, rent was a very cut and dry process. If you were I think it was three days past the due date of the 10th of the month, you got a 72 hour notice of eviction. Now, did we actually end up evicting you? No, but it was to just scare people into paying their rent. Um, but it had the opposite effect because if you get told you're going to kick down 72 hours and then that doesn't happen, and then that happens every month for like seven <laughs> months, you start to kind of catch on that it's not a real threat. Um, and also, who wants to? threatened students, not me. Um, so now what we do is we only send out 72 hour notices. Um, we only even send out rent letters really after two months lateness. We assume that if you're a month behind, you probably got a financial aid disbursement um, a little late. Uh, maybe there was something that happened at work. Um, two months, we'll send you a letter and we basically say in the letter, we're here to be flexible. We care about you. Please tell us what's going on. 
Um, if you don't hear back, we will issue this thing. But don't worry about it. It's just a thing. Like we try to balance the legal language um, with some of that compassionate language. And that's been very effective. We've had very few instances where students are, are super late with rent. I can count on one hand the number of times I've had to do a 72 hour notice even. Um, and I think we've only ever evicted for rent once. And that was at the beginning of my tenure here. Um, similarly, we altered our petition process. So students can submit petitions um, to uh, argue a charge uh, or a fine or a fee <clears throat> or to ask to be released from their contract without paying the uh, breakage fee. And it used to be those petitions were gathered with the residence hall petitions, but that didn't make any sense because as well-intentioned as our main campus peers are, they don't really know what the situation is. So now that's actually handled in-house. Um, me, Christina, Jeannie, Carlo, we review those petitions once a week. Um, and we consult with um, our supervisor, who's the um, assistant director for assignments, and it's been working really well. Um, and then we also work with Dean of Students Office, the Office of International Affair, Billing, other campus partners. These are all folks who um, can uh, provide resources to folks who are experiencing a financial concern. So that's been really positive. Um, security and safety. It, like I said, it's an ongoing thing, and, and we don't necessarily know how to handle it because it's not something necessarily that we can do anything about. Um, a lot of it is city issues um, and that the city really needs to do some deep soul searching on. Um, but some of the proposed changes, uh, we try to align with crime prevention through environmental design um, so that any improvements we make, we want to make sure that it is um, really built into the community and not in a way that's just like throwing up a giant chain link fence mm -hmm. around Spencerville. Um, so security cameras, we are putting in some fencing, but it's actually this really nice Oregon green fencing that's been repurposed from the, the demolition of uh, Hayward Field, which is our track field that recently got pulled down. Um, they're calling it a renovation, but they started from scratch, so I don't know if it's a renovation. But we get their fence, um, and then potentially locking dumpster areas, um, because we do get a lot of folks who come and, and root through the garbage, and they're looking for recyclables, etc. We wouldn't have an issue with this, except it creates a lot of work for our custodial staff. Uh, they've sent me a lot of pictures of coming in on Monday morning and the trash is just everywhere. And we also did have a student come to us recently and say that their identity was stolen. And when UOP did an investigation, it's because they put some of their personal documents in the recycling. So <clears throat> that's something we're looking at. Um, changes to processes. So we charge formally for any kind of trespassing now. It used to be UOP would come out and say, please leave. Now what they do is they actually say, you are being trespassed from this area. It doesn't go on like their record. It doesn't result in an arrest, um, but it does provide an incentive not to come back to this particular area. Um, and again, that's something that I, I personally, I struggle with and I'm not fully comfortable with the entire process, but we do have a, a very compassionate UOPD force and they do a lot of training around it. And when I've seen them interact, it is compassionate, but it's, yeah, it's, it's challenging. And you can probably tell by the discomfort of my voice, it feels awkward to me. Um, we're continuing to have meetings between UOPD facilities and Res Life to see what we can do about this. Um, Michael asks, do your residents pay rent via their student accounts? Yes, they do. Yep. Um, so they are able to manage their rent payments through what we call DuckWeb, which is um, where all those charges <clears throat> and fees are held even for tuition. So it just goes on to there. There you go. Yeah, easy peasy. Okay, so um, how do we address lack of relevant social opportunities? Um, we try to do programming that meets various audience needs. So we have a big termly program once a quarter that is very much everybody can find something they like. You can see we've got a moon bounce. We've upgraded our moon bounce in recent years. Now it's an obstacle course. Um, free food, of course, is the universal joiner. Um, but we screen movies, we have crafts. Uh, we try to make it so that anybody who comes can enjoy some part of it. And we really do see a range of ages and, and, and identities at these programs. But we also try to do targeted programs that are more for a specific audience. So we had gotten complaints kind of early on that grad students, single grad students without families, didn't really feel like they were connecting with other grad students. And so we did a... Um, a grad student social at uh, a McMenamin's, which is a, a 
relatively, well, I guess y'all look from the North Coast. Y'all know what the Commandments <laughs> is. But we went, there's one right by um, grad housing. And so we had a, a social there. Um, but it's still an ongoing issue trying to get to the folks who are even more satellite than our satellite campus. Spencer View has the benefit of being somewhat self-contained. And so folks see one another, their kids play outside. Um, but Graduate Village doesn't even have a lobby. I mean, it does, but not like anywhere you can sit and socialize. There's no study lounges in it. It's very poorly built. Um, so we're always trying to find ways to connect those folks. East Campus houses can be a little bit isolated because they're literally in their houses. Mm -hmm. Um, and trying to connect students with town and city programs. Eugene has a ton going on. So we try to look in Eugene Weekly and see what's happening around town. When Halloween is coming up, like we try to put in like, what's happening for Halloween? Where can you bring your kids? Where can you bring your adult self? Um, so we try to put that out there to folks, as well as relevant campus programs, the big stuff. Mm -hmm. Um, one of our solutions is to bring the resources to the students, um, including travel and transportation services. Uh, right outside our Spencer View office, we now have one of the campus shuttles <clears throat> that stops every 20 minutes. Um, it only runs from like 4.30 to 9 p.m. or something like that, but it's at least one of those resources that can get you to and from campus. Um, the resource fairs and collaborative programs that Francis and the Community Assistance put on um, Francis had a non-trad dad's pub quiz last fall, was it? Yeah, that was for November. So okay. we try to get ourselves on the calendar for some of these like um, university initiatives. So when they did November, they said, can you do something about men and masculinity that sort of fits in family housing? And so it was a pub quiz. Um, one of my side hustles is I do trivia once a week. I host at um, Hop Valley. And so I put together a, a pub quiz and we had like an actual cash bar that catering brought out. And it was all dad theme. Mm -hmm. um, as well as the biannual clothing swap, which uh, you know is a nice free event that people can come and socialize and check out all the you know wares that people are bringing by. Um, our most important campus partners that we try to involve or get involved with are uh, Dean of Students Office, uh, UCC University Council Council Center, <laughs> uh, the non-traditional student services, UOPD, of course. Um, they help us out, they educate us, they uh, patrol, have up their patrols for us in lieu of some of the thefts and trespassing. Um, Pathway Oregon and TRIO, and also the Graduate School. And kind of a neat note about the um, clothing swap, uh, this is again something that I'm not a parent, this is something I learned by coming out to family housing. Kids clothes are expensive and you have to buy them constantly <laughs> um, because children are just growing. Like by the time they're three months old, it's like a totally different outfit than when they were two months old which sounds frustrating to me. Um, but the clothing swap is nice because parents are actually able to bring clothes. Um, and even if you don't bring clothes to swap, um, you can just take. And it ends up being a really great service for a lot of our parents. And that is a collaboration with the non-traditional student services office. And they're just wonderful. They do such great things on this campus. Um, how are we meeting some of these international, the challenges faced by international students? Um, we're trying to simplify processes and clarify processes when it doesn't need to be super legalistic. We, we try to like make it more simple and straightforward. Um, flexibility and enforcement, not that we <clears throat> would like overlook a conduct issue with an international student, but I also try to look at the way that these conduct processes that we have are not serving our international students. If I um, am looking at our annual health and safety inspections, for example, and a bunch of our reinspections are in international apartments, that to me says that maybe we're not making our health and safety policies clear. And so I try to bring that lens to the work in conduct, to the work with health and safety, um, while still maintaining consistency, but you know, again, trying to have some flexibility with that. We engage a lot with the Office of International Affairs. They're wonderful. Um, they've come out to our resource fairs, um, and I've been able to sort of touch base with them just when I have a question. Uh, for instance, recently there was a reinterpretation of the statutes around how many hours uh, a student can work on campus. Hitherto, community assistants were considered student leaders, and so their 20 hours weren't counted. Now there's talk of them maybe counting those student hours, in which case I can't hire international students anymore, which is super messed up because, as I mentioned, we're 49% international in family housing. So um, that's definitely something I want to figure out. And so we've got a meeting on the books with the Office of International Affairs to see 
where is that interpretation of the statutes coming from? Because I think right now there's two different folks over in our general counsel office who are giving different interpretations to the different offices. So we got to get that lined up. And promotion of bias response services. So we do have racism, a lot of it, um, in Eugene. And we have racism right here at the UO. And if somebody is the uh, recipient of bias, be it based on race, nationality, gender, religion, et cetera, we want them to be able to address that. Um, because by putting in a bias report, it's compiled into an annual um, broader bias report that addresses bias throughout campus. Uh, and that helps uh, our team and the Dean of Students Office know what services are needed for folks. So that's pretty cool. Um, so now we're going to talk about challenges behind the scenes. And I love this picture. I think this perfectly represents what is happening in our office on a day to day basis. Um, do you want to talk about occupancy? Sure. So FHUA historically operates in the red. Um, in order to change this, though, we all we have to maintain occupancy up to 95%, which can be a challenge in the off season months. If somebody leaves their apartment in uh, you know, October, November, uh, we may struggle a bit to find somebody who hasn't already found housing for the school year or mm -hmm. for the term. So it could sit empty for a couple months. Um, fortunately, this year we're pretty darn full for the fall. Yeah. Um, so yeah, that's, that's, that's my first second fall, I guess. I was here last fall, but we were struggling a bit last fall to fill um, simply because people had found housing already or they wanted to keep their application open for next year. Yeah, and that is all Christina and her team, by the way, just like getting on the phones, calling people on our wait list. We had a wait list that was like 200 names long when Christina got out here and Christina just went through and like totally condensed it to like who is actually still looking for housing. Um, but yeah, it, we actually have great occupancy. It's just this apartment complex was built at a deficit. And as I'm sure all of you know, sometimes at a university, we borrow from Peter to pay for Paul so you know there's debts that we're paying off that aren't necessarily to do with family housing but we still need to operate at that max capacity it's be challenging um so just a look at uh some of the numbers we have 408 rentable units um there is the option for students to renew each year if they maintain their eligibility uh, we do not have a maximum length of stay in place if they continue to meet those eligibility requirements um, which are basically age requirements once you're over the age of 20. And if you are full-time eligible, your account is in good standing, you would be able to renew um, if you've had no conduct charges that are, you know, typically we work through those, but at times we are able to non-renew students. Um, last year in June, we had 158 students renewed for the 2018-19 year. Um, so we had 250 vacated units throughout the summer. Um, we also had at that time 500 plus applications with preferred move-in dates throughout the summer so we were not able to offer everybody an apartment or house um, but we did uh, chip away and, and make sure that students didn't know they can keep their application open for next fall and uh, then you know the, the standards at which we assign are basically the date you applied so they will have probably first preference over those units next fall and it's hard because one of the groups we work with, we, we had mentioned Dean of Students in Pathway, Oregon. We have a lot of campus partners also within the graduate school. We've got people who, who will say this student desperately needs housing. And we try to like be flexible with our wait list in that. But when you've got 500 plus applications, it becomes so much harder to find that flexibility. And everybody has a compelling reason why they want to be here. There's great child care nearby our family housing units. It's, it's very hard um, and we know there's a lot of students who are facing housing insecurity um, so it can be really hard to like determine how because we also don't want to then push someone back on the wait list who may also have some of those same issues that just aren't stated um, michael asks can residents uh in the residence hall easily move into the apartments maybe or mid-quarter i don't think so because i think undergrad res halls face some of the same issues trying to get people in beds Plus, they're more expensive because they've got the meal plan, so it's harder for them in some way. Mm -hmm. Was that specifically for a resident? Yeah, a resident. Yeah. Oh, yes. Um, 
they are able to if we happen to have you know those odd vacancies. Um, sometimes people are on different terms. Law students here are on different terms scheduled in um, other master's programs and things like that. So on occasion, we'll have you know five vacant units at the end of a term in the middle of the year, um, and most of the time we can fill those with incoming students who are transfers. Um, conduct is a big challenge out here um, because I think that residents, when they get to the residence hall, they expect this. They know like there's an RA and they're not drinking, I'll be documented. Um, but it's not really an established part of the culture here. And so, and also the other thing too is traditional sanctioning. I can't necessarily assign an educational sanction to a 35 year old single mother grad student. It's just not gonna fly. Um, some of our residents do tend to push boundaries. I think a lot of folks who get here, they're more self-actualized, they're uh, later in life, and they kind of know who they are and what they um, what they feel that they deserve and are entitled to. Um, and so some of that can sometimes be challenging when you're trying to tell someone, no, I'm sorry, you can't actually put up a bamboo privacy screen because it actually increases the ability for a thief to hide behind that and we're trying to look out for you. But now we're having an argument about whether or not legally we can say you can't have that bamboo privacy screen, et cetera. Um, and it's also more difficult to enforce things because we don't have that constant contact you get in the residence hall. Um, you know, we notice things when we do our balcony inspections. If a custodian is in a unit and they smell cigarette smoke, they can report that to me. But, you know, that does make it appear, and, and somewhat rightfully so, to a resident that it's random or you didn't document my neighbor for this um this is bias and so we're trying to get folks to know that they can report things to us and we'll address it and that our conduct process isn't designed to like kick you out because that's the other thing too is because folks see us as their landlord when we bring them in for a conduct hearing they feel like they're about to get booted out onto the street um uh conduct issues are also often tied in with really complicated stuff um i will have someone say my neighbor's very noisy and then I'll have that person come into my office and be like, they're just uncomfortable because culturally they're thinking I'm making excessive noise, but this is just me and my family having, you know, a, a small gathering, or this is how me and my partner talk. And I think they're uncomfortable because we are uh, an interracial couple. That is literally something that I had the other day. Um, relationship issues. So I had someone the other day saying there's, I have a noise complaint. And the first thing I have to ask is you're saying your neighbor is shouting do you feel that there might be a domestic violence situation going on because we have couples living together um and then suddenly that noise complaint becomes a title nine report um and then neighbor conflicts you know it's it's yeah it's complicated um so some of the solutions we've come up with is trying to just be really consistent with our process making sure that the process is timely we hear about it letter goes out and every time that's what happens balcony inspections they happen this week, your letters are going out this week, and we're going to make it clear in the newsletter exactly what you're going to be documented for if it's out there to sort of make folks aware that this is something we do. Uh, we use our newsletter to communicate out a lot of policies, um, and that's becoming more popular. Uh, we were finding a lot of our leaseholders were just deleting it, um, and so we put an option in there. If your household member, if your roommate, um, or someone who doesn't receive it would like to receive it, give me their name. And so now we've got a list of like 50 people who have opted in um, to receive that newsletter. So that means 50 people um, out there in those units uh, making this information known to their leaseholders. So that's pretty cool. But it's an ongoing challenge. It's something I work with our assistant director for conduct on. Um, um, some of the challenges that we identified that we were facing when I arrived here last August um, was the supervision of the desk staff. Uh, they had very limited in-person supervision. Uh, my position was vacant for some time. Um, so they were just having some peer-to-peer -peer learning and training um, with some of the more seasoned desk assistants, which was okay, but also certain liberties were being taken that probably weren't um, very professional or weren't um, you know, aligning with a well-organized office and uh, the promotion of customer service. Um, another issue was safety. Um, student staff felt really unprepared when closing the office at 6 p.m. by themselves, um, at uh, you know dealing with angry or frustrated individuals coming in. We didn't have any kind of protocol when I first arrived. Uh, 
and also communication with students, with their peers, and with um, supervisor staff. So the students at the desk uh, didn't really have the, the best communication skills. Um, so we've worked on all three of these. Um, supervision, I'm now present um, as their defined supervisor for daily support. Um, so they can turn to me and ask me a question. Um, they can refer students to me who um, they may be having a frustrated interaction with. They can also refer to Francis, which is very helpful. He's also here at Pennsylvania often. Um, we've made a safety protocol. We have safety and security trainings for the desk staff um, so they feel a little more confident. We've also um, made sure that when opening and closing the office, there are at least two people at the desk um, since after about 3.30, most of the staff leaves for the day. Um, so the desk staff can feel at least supported in that way. We've also implemented um, some security, or just secure the office a little bit better, um, especially for that closing shift in preparation for that um, by locking doors, closing doors, things in advance um, that shouldn't need to be accessed. Um, we've also improved our communication quite a bit. We have an interaction log that we um, essentially log our interactions with any student. So we are basically able to pick up where one person left off and try to remedy a situation with a student should they call back later in the day, come in later in the day and, and wonder if their solution was, um, was found. Um, we also have monthly staff meetings. Um, so we address any miscommunications all as a team. Um, since there are only typically maximum two desk assistants at the desk at once, we can all communicate with what we've seen as um, issues at the desk, issues with any packages or things like that that we might have and talk about um, any processes that we might need to change or reorganize. Uh, we also use a Trello board for communication at shift changes. We also put our daily tasks and things there, um, but it leaves the ability for the students to leave a note for their um, the person taking over their shift or for myself. And I can also leave notes and tasks for individuals if I'm going to be at a meeting or something like that. So we've implemented some of those communication strategies which are helpful. I'm seeing two two great questions here. Um, so Catherine asks, have you had to manage domestic violence situation in family housing? Yes, and it is, it's hard. Um, both it, in two ways. One, you know, I mentioned we work with DOS to identify students who need emergency housing. So we've had folks come out of domestic violence situations into a family housing unit as a means of escaping that. Um, and those who have worked with domestic violence um, will know it can be a really hard process to fully bring someone out of a toxic relationship. And we have had situations where we move someone into family housing to get them out of an abusive relationship. And then three months later, we're adding their person to the lease. And there's nothing we can do. You know, we'll communicate with DOS. DOS uh, has the confidential advocates who work with that student. But ultimately, all we can do at that point is make sure we're monitoring that unit, make sure we are providing support and resources. The folks make their own decisions and, and we need to be able to respect their agency. Um, when it's something that happens within university housing, like they're already here, um, we take every report extremely seriously. Um, we, uh, our staff is trained to contact UOPD, to contact pro staff on call. Uh, we do have the on-call advocates who can come out um, and support a victim of domestic violence. Um, yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's, one of the worst things that can happen out here, uh, but it does happen. And um, so also from Catherine, are you concerned about the safety of the families in that case? Yeah, definitely, for sure. It's That's one of my big beefs is right now, there isn't really a background check process necessarily to get housing. Um, I would say that when, as soon as I become aware of that, so I was referring to a specific instance wherein I became aware that somebody, someone's friend actually reported my friend who lives in your housing, they've been having their ex-boyfriend over a lot and I'm worried that they're getting back into that relationship. Immediately I reached to the Dean of Students office, um, people, Dean of Students counselors who had worked with that person. Um, yeah, and that's that's absolutely a conversation we have uh, with housing admin, with Dean of Students, with UOPD. Um, in the instance where somebody, uh, where there was a concern or threat of violence, Whatever we are legally able to do, we can trespass somebody, for example, through our conduct process. Um, 
but there are some nuances with the law that make it challenging. And yeah, no, that's a, a huge concern for me. Um, and, you know, we've also had to navigate that with students. We had a student who OD'd on drugs and that became a security concern for their neighbors. And then we had to have that conversation with like the campus recovery center of like, well, just because they're on drugs doesn't mean like they're dangerous to your children. But where is that line? So like it becomes very complicated with these situations. And fortunately, we do get a lot of support um, from housing staff when stuff hits the fan um, in that way. But our DOS office is great. Our, camp, our confidential advocates are great. Um, and they have been really prompt in addressing these things. Part of it too, and this is, you know, this is a good thing, but it can be a challenge, is obviously if it's a confidential report, we don't see that. Um, so I will sometimes be told, so-and-so has had an experience. We can't tell you anything about it, but just know, keep an eye out on this unit. And, you know, we just have to respect that privacy and kind of navigate that gray. Um, yeah. Then we have another question from Sapphire. How do you address reports in family housing that may be the result of bias? What do you do in the moment and in advance? So this has been a huge learning opportunity for me in the last three years because you know, I think I had been used to previously just sort of taking a report at its face value, and that is definitely no longer the case. Um, I, as soon as I receive a report, a report, I kind of go in making sure that I'm not identifying immediately with the person who submitted it. Like I'm not making a decision about that person's culpability based on what the complainant says. I want to hear what the respondent's point of view is. Sometimes it's pretty apparent pretty early on when I hear the respondent side of it that this was a report of bias. Um, we had a major bias. Oh, major is a strong word. We had a very tumultuous bias incident occur last term where can't really get into the details, both insofar as length and privacy, but it had to do with chalk drawings and not, no racial epithets were used, but somebody felt that chalk drawings had been sort of made calling them out and they responded with their own chalk drawings about white privilege. Um, and so I had to field a lot of emails that week about how someone saying white privilege does not mean that, that that's not racist. That's just the thing that exists and that you have. <laughs> um, so we had a staff, uh, not a staff meeting, but a community town hall with the Division of Equity Inclusion, Dean of Students Office, myself, our department director, um, everybody had an opportunity to talk about their feelings in that situation. Um, I will, in those instances where someone brings bias concerns to me, I'll sit that, I'll sit down with that student. I'll explain to them like, hey, also, I'm not saying that, you know, I'm the person to talk to either. Like, just, I know y'all can't see me at the moment, but you saw my picture. I'm a very white man. And so I'm not going to be everybody's best sounding board. And I make that clear at the outset that I am here for you care about you, I can be a support for you. If there's other people who want to talk to you, let me give you some resources. Let me tell you about our bias response team. Let me tell you about our wonderful folks over in CMAE. Um, and so those are some of the ways that we'll kind of address it. It's just very much trying to go in, limiting to what degree we can, our own implicit bias. Um, but yeah, when we have to have that conversation with a resident that like, hey, you might be a little bit racist, it's not an easy conversation. Um, so it's something we try to do a lot of training on. All right, we are coming up near the end of the presentation. We've only got a few more slides. Um, another challenge, working with agent, aging buildings. So I mentioned that some of our houses were built in 1910. That provides issues, um, not all of which I'm at liberty to speak about. But I mean, just in the sense of some of these need to come offline because they become too expensive to even maintain. Um, just some of the facilities upkeep challenges of that. Um, we do annual health and safety inspections to try to make sure that everything is in good working order, but even that provides challenges of its own. Um, and so far as residents feeling their privacy is being invaded, it's just always something um, with those inspections. Um, balancing our compassion with liability management. So, you know, I said we try to be flexible, we try to be student centered. Um, but like some things are hard to not do, you know, if somebody trashes their unit at checkout, those fees can be pretty expensive. And then somebody emails me and says like, this is really going to be a huge financial blow. 
and then I have to look at that too with, but we also need to like be able to pay for repairing this unit in order for us to survive and continue to provide low cost housing for non-traditional students. So it's hard, especially too, because sometimes when we just sort of brush something off or say it's not that big a deal, it ends up escalating in ways where now like I kind of just try to find the connection in every single thing about like, what is the worst possible thing that can happen? Because that will probably happen. Um, stepchild syndrome, and I use this phrase as a stepchild who feels very loved, <laughs> um, so this is no shade to my stepdad, um, but I think we've heard this phrase before referring to family housing as like, we feel outside of the hole, or we feel that we're going to get the least amount of attention from housing, the least amount of funding, um, and that can lead to major staff burnout and morale issues. Um, it kind of ebbs and flows, but Christina has been really wonderful in creating team builders um, and, and some of the other folks in this office as well. You know, we really celebrate birthdays here, everybody's birthday, <laughs> except my birthday. I'm not bitter. We're always um, close on Francis's birthday. We had a bake off. <laughs> um, yeah, so these are things we do to kind of keep team feelings good. And we try to just remind ourselves that, yeah, it's the things that are most challenging that take up the most time and the most energy, but think about the people who really benefit from this, mm -hmm. and we'll try to focus in on that. So there are a couple of slides of future plans and initiatives, but I think I'm actually going to maybe say in these last couple of minutes, are there any other questions? And as we wait for questions to come in, I can kind of briefly talk about some of these things, but if we see a question, uh, we'll answer it, and, and now's the time just to ask any of those. Oh. Okay, sorry. So this past year, we've um, further integrated with Starres. We implemented it July of 2017, I believe, so just before I started. Um, but this is where we've slowly been moving all of our student information and documentation into the system. So it's a full, complete record of this student, um, but they're also a resident with family housing. So uh, we keep information like who has an emotional support animal in here. Um, any of the forms and or um, fix it requests and maintenance requests for units are kept in Starez um, on the student side um, so they can submit all of those online. Our rental agreements were fully digital this year um, for the renewal period and any new move-ins past July 1st. Um, so students always have access to a digitally signed copy of their lease agreement or they can come in and get something from us. Um, it also helps us to better track uh, student trends and, and what's going on in our units uh, to make further improvements in the processes that we use on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, we do a resident satisfaction survey every year to get a sense of how people are feeling about community, uh, safety and security, etc. And so that's going to go out in October. Um, we, do, we want to do an FHUA video series to make some of our more nuanced policies more fun and engaging. I have specifically requested funding for puppets. I've been approved. <laughs> Um, but I told I need to write the scripts first. Um, improvements to our community gardens to make them more accessible and more just a, a more viable option for folks. Uh, marking our plots more clearly and getting a better plot rental system. And most importantly for us is connecting with other institutions. So I think that is my hope from this presentation. Um, we're going to show the slide that has our emails in a moment. I love talking about family housing. Do you love talking about family housing? I do, yes. Christina also loves talking about family housing. <laughs> Um, so we would love to set up a phone call with you to talk about what you do and hear some of your strategies, some of your challenges. Um, so if that's ever something you have interest in, if you're in the Eugene area, we'll buy you lunch. Yeah, do it. Questions we already asked. Oh, Sylvina was watching. Hi, Sylvina. Sylvina's our <laughs> boss, and she's the best. Um, and so these are our emails. Um, DFP at uorgan.edu is me. See belong. Yeah. Yeah. Pardon my French. Oh, goodness. Oh, geez. I made it all the way through. Did a great job. That's it. That's the whole thing. Thank you all. Thank you. Any other questions? All right. So we'll go ahead and wait for some other questions to pop up here. Um, but just everyone, please remember that I already put the um, feedback form in the uh, chat there. Uh, and everyone's got, getting a lot of thank yous for our presenters. And I would like to personally thank them as well for presenting on this topic. Uh, it's something that we 
need to focus on more. I'm glad. And I like uh, Slovenia's idea about a uh, drive-in conference. Hopefully we can set that up in the future. Uh, but for everyone else, we'll see you next month. Bye. Bye. <laughs>